a place that's been set up where we can obey God all the time. All the time. These are goats. And they need to be milked twice a day. My name is Kishab Gil Aviv. And there's a meaning to that. Do you want to know the meaning? Okay. It means the springtime joy that comes from hearkening with the intent to obey. I met the community uh, one night in Princeton, New Jersey. I was a little skeptical and wary, you know, for whatever reasons, I'm sure there's lots of good reasons, for one to be a little wary about people and cults or whatever, you know. But at the same time, I really wanted to be open to whatever it was that was going on. And I believed this was a place of healing. Twelve Tribes is something that's emerging. We see ourselves as a spiritually emerging culture. We're very accessible to the public at large, but we do try to insulate our culture from certain elements that we see as undesirable. And I think most people can relate to this in varying ways. I think most parents attempt to insulate their children from certain influences that they don't deem uh, as healthy. My name is Shua and I'm I'm going to be getting married next weekend. I'm very excited about it because in a lot of ways I feel that it's a fulfillment of the purpose that I was born for. I know our children are very precious. And I really mean that. And it um, would be nice if you could come to the wedding that's going to be here because It's going to be two children that have grown up here that are getting married, so it's like that'll be good for you to see. And there, there, you know, there's a purity here. There's a purity in them, and it's really wonderful. It's beautiful. It's precious. It's really very, very precious. I don't know how to say. It. It's like on all the earth, it's so precious. You know, they're preserved from a lot of things, and, and they're just so important. Our homes, they don't have a, a television right in the living room, and we do dress a little differently, and we um, don't partake necessarily in all the particular events that others may partake of. But um, a lot of that's because a, a culture is a delicate thing. I've gotten to know some different kids in town, but the things that the world allows is a lot different than what we allow. I don't want to be influenced by certain things out there and so we have to I have to watch myself that I I don't intermingle too much where I'd be influenced and then influence other children in the community or people in the community bring things in from the world I guess you could say He ran out there. We don't believe that just two, two youth would be that good of an influence on each other. There's not much judgment, like self-judgment going on as far as just ideas and thoughts and they could end up getting each other in trouble. These are some of my children. This is Amida Ruth, this is Yatham, this is Eliana, and this is Yakara. And I have one more girl named Hananel and one boy named Hosa. 
it was, well, it was early. It was six in the morning. We weren't up yet. And I was in my room and oh, I was asleep. And I heard a knock on the door. So I was just like, come in or good morning because you just said good morning. You thought it was a wake up call and they kept knocking. So I said, come in. And it was a big tall officer and said, get out of bed and come down to the living room. The legal battle is just beginning between Vermont authorities and a small fundamentalist Christian group that settled in that state. At the heart of their dispute is what church members call loving discipline, prescribed by the Bible. Some authorities, however, call it child abuse. Armed with affidavits reporting child beatings, state troopers 10 days ago entered the homes of church members and took 112 children into custody. They confiscated rods used for punishment. However, a judge without ruling on the question of child abuse called the search illegal and released the children. We had a little bit of a warning in, in that some people had some dreams that there was a, uh, a tidal wave coming and, and that after the tidal wave swept over us, we were still standing. There's always people that don't like what we do mm -hmm. and they're going to spread all kinds of rumors and lies, you know, and that's pretty much how the, the, the raid of Island Pond in 1984 developed to the point where the state raided it. It was all based on hearsay and lies and grossly exaggerated um, things that people said were going on in the community. We believe that discipline needs to be um, carried out in love, with patience, with self-control, and then that there needs to be restoration and forgiveness. As, as part of raising children, we firmly believe in, in spanking children. My name is Khalil Chambers, or it was Khalil Chambers. Uh, when I got adopted, it officially got changed to Kevin Donovan. I ran away when I was 14. It started with mainly the discipline, the child discipline, the corporal punishment, and kind of grew out of that. It was the first thing I didn't really agree with. One time I remember in particular, uh, when I lived in Coxsackie, I was getting a small amount of um, training or school education and the one guy that was doing it um, he was very uh, strict one time in school I didn't raise my hand and he went and got a um, twig with uh, buds and stuff on it and told me to bend over and drop my trousers and start whacking me like as hard as he could just swinging and swinging away um, and I, in the middle of it, I stood up, and I, he goes, what are you doing? I go, I ain't going to take this. I, um, and I walked out of the room, stormed out of the room past the class and everything, and went over to my dad, my biological dad's office, and told him what had happened. He goes, well, how many times did he spank you? I go, uh, nine or ten times. He goes, okay, bend over, and he takes out this bamboo stick about this big around and uses both hands and it starts swinging it at me. And I, and then he goes, since you didn't receive your um, discipline the first time, you gotta go back and take, take it again. So I went back over and took my discipline the next time. No one's here against their own will. And it's, you know, a choice to be here. So when our children grow up, if they don't want and desire to be here and choose to follow the faith of their parents and of our God, our Father, then it's like they're going to leave, and then what we got is nothing. We want our children to fear going out of our boundaries. The way things were uh, kind of put together in there was that it was kind of like a everybody for themselves out here kind of thing. Um, but I, when I once I got out here and saw things for myself, it kind of showed me that people do care, care about each other out here just as much, if not more, uh, than they do in there. Um, and people have friends and can trust each other. The thoughts of maybe missing out on what other kids in the world get to do or what they get to experience, where they get to go, you know, things they get to do, school, whatever, it definitely, definitely comes in. For sure. You grow up here, you're born here, you're raised here, but then you, is if you were to come in, you would ask to be baptized. 
into the, immersed into this new life. But when you're raised here, it's a little different. So at that age, it's not always 14. Sometimes it's a little younger, sometimes it's a little older, depending on the maturity of the child and, you know, their ability to decide. But it's at that age that they make that decision that they want to be here. They want to commit their lives to the same purpose because it's a commitment. I would not have known love if my teen. I don't know if it's fully hit yet. I mean, I'm very happy for her, and she's a wonderful girl, and I wish them the best, but it happens remarkably fast. I will praise you for eternity. Our son came to us, and she came to her parents, and they both told us that they were attracted to the other, you know, and they didn't go to each other either, and they told us, and. So we told him to sit on it for a little while <laughs> and just let it wait because they were pretty young. First part of the wedding is more like a, and I think we actually came up with the term, I don't know, we, a pre-enactment. And I know there's reenactments of, but we actually do as a, it's a play or a pageant of what we see will happen in the end times when Jesus returns. So that first whole section of the wedding is like a play. And it's not really my wedding so much. I'm more playing the part of the bride of Messiah. What you're going to see today is going to depict the end. Those that, that want good are going to have chosen good. Those that want evil are going to choose evil. And there won't be anything left to do except come to the earth and destroy those who don't want what's good because that's what God wants. He wants what's good to go on eternally forever and ever and ever and ever. But how many more are so ungrateful? They take advantage of the system, you know, get as much cash as they can from this whole thing to go, to go buy designer pocketbooks. for us to give our daughter to Yobel. And we have so much anticipation for the fruit of their life. We talk a lot about our, when our little girls were born, they were born for a very specific and wonderful purpose. And, and that really is to um, build up man. And so I'm really thankful that she can go on to this stage of her life and be um, Yobel's wife. And Yobel, we are, we unreservedly relinquish and give all of our authority to you over our daughters.
freedom to me isn't being given anything and everything with no guidance on how to choose what's right. But freedom to me has been the fact that my parents raised me with very clear defined standards but gave me a great purpose.